Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Um, the title for this morning's message is The Greatest Commandment for Every Generation. And we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 6, uh, verses 4 to 25. So you can turn there while I get a squig of water. Question. What will be your legacy? What do you want to be remembered for? When you pass away, what do you want to leave behind for the generation that follows you? Maybe you have a box of recipes that were passed down from your grandma and you want to leave them for your family. Maybe you're an artist and you want to leave behind the work that you've produced. In our passage this morning, Moses is about to die. He's not going with this new generation of Israelites to the promised land. What do you think he wants to leave in the hearts and minds of the people as they stand on the border of the plains of Moab? Well, he leaves them these words, love God and keep his commandments. There's nothing more vital and eternally life-giving for the generations that will follow him and the generations that will follow us as believers in the Lord Jesus. It's to leave as a legacy than love for God. Love for God is the greatest commandment for every generation. And so the main point of the passage centers on the love of God. So here's the main point, if you want it in a sentence. Exclusively love God by obeying him and testifying of his faithfulness to the next generation. It's more of an argument, something I want to convince you of, to exclusively love God by obeying him and testifying of his faithfulness to the next generation. And we'll look at um, this argument in three points. From verses four to nine, we'll look at um, loving God exclusively. From verses 10 to 19, obeying God entirely. And from verses 20 to 25, testifying of God explicitly. So let me read God's word. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers, by thrusting out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has promised. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. 
And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So, love God exclusively. As Jackie explained so well last night, Moses begins to um, mediate God's word um, to God's people at the end of chapter five. So in verse 31 of chapter five, God says, but you, Moses, stand here by me and I will tell you the whole commandment and statutes and rules. So God says to Moses, he will tell the Israelites the whole commandment and statutes and rules that they should observe. Then Moses says, y'all better be careful to do what God commands. Do everything he says so that it will go well with you. And then chapter six opens with Moses stating that this is the commandment rules and that God expects them to obey. And just what is the commandment? We see in verses four and five. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. We call this the Shema. Some of you may have heard of it. It's the centerpiece of Jewish prayers Shema literally means listen or hear. When we think of hearing, we think of it as merely taking information in. But Shema connects listening and obedience. There's an expectation that you will respond to what you hear. These verses tell us that God is God alone. He has no rival. No one compares to him. He deserves the fullest expression of their love towards him because he's demonstrated in fullness his love towards them. Well, how did he demonstrate his love toward them? Listen to Deuteronomy 4, 33 to 37. For ask now the days that are past which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth and ask from one end of the heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of a fire as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you? <clears throat> did for you. in Egypt before our, uh, your eyes, <coughs> excuse me, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Out of heaven, he let you hear his voice that he might discipline you. <coughs> and on earth, he let you see his father, his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence and by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Y'all, this is amazing. And you know what? This isn't even the fullest expression of his love, looking at God's great deliverance and God speaking to his people and God showing signs and wonders before them. The fullest expression of his love will come through the promised Messiah, Jesus, who will deliver God's people from the enemy of their souls, Satan, and from his evil schemes which are designed to keep God's people enslaved to their sin. The Shema expresses not only the command to love God, but how to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. We see similar words in Matthew 22, 37. There it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So the heart emphasizes the will and the emotions. The soul refers to one's entire physical being. And then the mind, of course, relates to our thoughts and understanding. 
Now might or strength that's used here usually for us gives us the impression of power. But here it has to do with resources, with the things that would garner power and influence for someone. Every part of our being, all of our heart, all of our soul, our mind, and our mighty resources should be devoted to expressing exclusive love for the Lord. So love for God. I'm going to be um, sharing with y'all a lot of songs because I like music. You might get some of them. You might not know some of them. But one of them, you might have heard this song. It's been really popular. Cue the, mu cue the music. It goes like this. I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and in the song, I just want y'all to raise your hand if you ever heard that song before. Come on now. Okay, some of y'all. Anyway, <laughs> and it's a simple song in one sense. I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you? But think about it. In the song, it's expressing a truth that's being expressed right here, right? What's wrong with you? It's obvious that God deserves our love. And her saying in the song, I love God, you don't love God, it's a kind of rhetorical question. Like, if you answer no, then what's wrong with you? God has done everything possible to show how exclusively he loves his people, culminating in the gift of his son. Surely God calls us to reciprocate that exclusive love towards him. I love God. Do you love God? How much do we really love God? Do we demonstrate our love for God and how we care for our bodies? Do we love God with our emotions and with our will? Do we love God with our minds? Are our resources devoted to loving God? And notice in these questions, I didn't even use the word all, as it stated in the, in the passage. But if I had, could any of us have answered yes? Yes, I love God with all my heart. No, none of us could answer yes to that. But all of us can consider how we might grow in demonstrating exclusive, holistic love for God. Speaking of songs, we used to sing a kid's song in a Bible study I was a part of. And it says... No, you can't keep Jesus love in a box, love in a box, love in a box. No, you can't keep Jesus love in a box because his love will come a-bubbling through. So I'll just keep Jesus love in my heart, love in my heart, love in my heart. I'll just keep Jesus love in my heart so his love will come a-bubbling through. Yeah, so, <laughs> as, and I think, again, this idea of this simplistic child's song it's so true, isn't it? As we store up and keep God's love in our hearts, it doesn't stay there. It overflows, it bubbles over, it spills out, right, into the lives of those around us. And as we grow in demonstrating exclusive love for God, it will overflow out of our hearts and into the lives of those in our homes and in our communities. Which brings us to verses six to nine here. <clears throat> these are very famous verses in Christian homes. They speak of the will. In a sense, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And remember that the heart is the center of the will. That means they flow from inside of us. It also speaks of our words. You shall teach or talk about them diligently with your children. It speaks of our way. It speaks of our rest when you lie down, when you rise up. It speaks of our witness, this binding on your hand, frontlets between your eyes, on the door posts of the gates of your home. These words of God's love that we teach our children should be like a billboard on display in our families and in our communities. There should be something on the inside of our hearts that's working on the outside in our families and in our communities that's producing wonderful change in our lives and in the lives of our families and the surrounding community. That was another song, if y'all didn't get it. Um, but it's true, something on the inside has to work its, the love of God that we have on the inside has to work its way on the outside and overflow into those that um, are around us. Now, a lot of people use this passage to talk about the importance of family devotions. And family devotions are important. 
But <clears throat> there could be the temptation to say that this passage is all about family devotions. And I think this is a limiting way to think about um, the, the verses here. It's not about structured family devotions where the family sits around the uh, table and, um, and discusses God's word after dinner, which is not a bad thing. Tons of families do that. Praise the Lord. But this passage is talking about not dinner table discussions, but all of life discussions. What happens when you're not at the dinner table? What happens when you wake up in the morning? When you send your kid off on the, on the bus or when you get ready to homeschool in the morning? What happens when you are on your way to the soccer game? Or what happens when your child is hurt? This passage is talking about infusing love for God throughout the regular rhythms of our lives. This is, is, we can, and I think what can happen is we can inadvertently um, hurt families when we say that the only way or the primary way to live out this passage practically is by having nightly family devotions. How many families, in how many families, have, has mom been upset because dad is not leading family in worship around the dinner table. I know I've had discussions with plenty of, of wives who have grieved the fact that their husbands weren't leading in family devotions in that structured, organized way. But it's been sweet to point out to them and to help them to think about other ways that maybe their husband is infusing love for God in the lives of their children in the normal rhythms of life. Or what about the torture that comes from <laughs> in families sometimes when somebody's under the table, somebody's asleep, nobody's paying attention, somebody's kind of on their phone, they're trying to get on Netflix, like you're trying to have family devotions and you know, the kids are tortured, you're tortured, everybody's miserable, and you just leave having to pray that somebody got something and the Lord was, you know, glorified in it some kind of way. <laughs> Y'all know. You know, or maybe there's a parent in the home who's not yet a believer, or maybe a single parent home, or maybe the cultural background isn't one where sitting around the dinner table is the norm. We can't force the, this, that expression of structured family worship on every family and inadvertently shame or guilt people into thinking that if they're not doing it this way, they're spiritually immature or they're unbiblical or ungodly or something like that. When I was growing up, we never had family devotions, but my grandma lived to be almost 104 years old. She literally could read her Bible upside down. It was amazing. <laughs> and she never limited her teaching me about the love of God to a specific day or a time or a particular kind of expression. You know what she did? She taught me to kneel beside her bed and pray the Lord's Prayer. She taught me um, through her life and through her living how to be forgiving and how to be loving. She taught me so many things just through her, uh, the overflow of the love of God in her life, um, it overflowed into my life. And Man, what a wonderful change that it's made in my life. So when this passage is presented merely as a text on family worship and devotions, I think we really limit its scope. Well, how do we apply it to people who don't have a traditional family structure? Or how do we apply it to single people? This is God's word meant for all God's people. What responsibility do you have to do your part in helping the children around us to love God? How you would do that is going to be very organic and natural to your relationship with the children in your life. The focus is, as you live out your life every day, use the opportunities the Lord gives to pass on his love to those whom the Lord places around us. However, this is not a call to be oversaved. <laughs> you know oversaved people. <clears throat> you might be an oversaved person. <laughs> so like everything your child does, you got to start beating them overhead with Jesus, right? Or a child does something and the parent gives like a 15-minute speech or sermonette. Sometimes children just need to obey. That's a command from the Lord. And you know what? That might be good enough for the moment. 
You don't have to take every moment of every day to go off into marathon explanations of their sin and how it affects them and how God sees it. There's a time and place for those things, don't get me wrong. But I'm convinced that if you have a regular habit of teaching God's love to your children when life is just normal, then you're gonna not have to spend maybe 15 minutes lecturing your child (laughs) when it's in a moment of discipline. Um, We can do this. Um, We can use the opportunities that the Lord has given us in the normal rhythms of life um, to teach our children. And when I say teach, our tendency, when we hear the word teach, what do we think about? We think about rules, you know. Rules-based parenting is just a trap for rules-based adults and rules-based Christians. God's steadfast love drives his desire for us to adhere to his law. Not so we can be better law keepers, but so that we can be better lovers, so that we can stay within the bounds of righteousness that reflect who he is. We need to strive for our children to be better lovers, not better law keepers. Law keepers don't get into heaven. Lovers get into heaven. My husband heard someone say that uh, the native language of fallen humanity is law, and we need to learn the language of Zion, and that language is one of grace. And so if we just speak our natural language, we're always going to be speaking law. We have to learn grace and the love of God. So keep God's word before your children in the way you live your life, in what you directly and indirectly teach them. And as God's word is is alive in your family, it should also be a visible display to the surrounding community. So what what is our community? Well, today it's your next door neighbor, it's social media, it's your city. Wherever you find yourselves in community, no one should have to ask, are they God's people? If it's bound on your frontlets and posted on your doorpost, it will be obvious to the surrounding community that this is a family devoted to the Lord. And you can, you know how you can tell some religious communities by um, what they wear? Well, we don't wear phylacteries and we don't have frontlets and all that stuff today, so how will the watching world know that we belong to the Lord? What's going to be the obvious um, demonstration of that for them. Well, the Bible tells us in John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you what? Have love for one another. Exactly. If we have love for one another. So what will you do to keep God's word on your heart? Read your Bible daily. It's good. <laughs> Memorizing scripture, journaling, singing, um, being in fellowship with the body of Christ in a local church, small groups, there's, you know, tons and tons of ways. Keep God's word on your heart. And how will you endeavor to teach God's love to your children? Using those natural conversations and circumstances that point to their will and their way and their witness and their waking and resting moments to point them to the love of God and how their behavior reflects their love for God. And how can you practice loving your brothers and sisters in the faith in such a way that the world knows we belong to Christ? So, love God exclusively. Second, obey God entirely. Verses 10 to 19. So there's this land that was promised all the way back from the time of Abraham. And often the promises of God uh, in Scripture point us back to the patriarchs, right? And part of the reason is simple. God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. His command doesn't change. His promises don't change. He has promised from the beginning that he was calling out a people to go to a place, to inhabit that place, and that his people would be under his protection and his care, living in his place, his way, at his appointed time. So this promise of the land is reiterated here with the repeated refrain, you did not. You didn't build it. You didn't dig or fill the cisterns. You didn't plan anything, but you're full. You didn't do that either. You didn't fill yourself. God did. You didn't do any of it. God has made every provision. God has done all of this. And he knows that his people would be tempted to take credit for what he's done, 
for what he's provided for their enjoyment. And aren't we the same? All the good provisions God made for them should point back to him. But they and we can look at all the stuff we have and what do we say? This is what I did. We're prone to forget God in our abundance. We forget that every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I guess some people also forget God in time of need and they seek provision in their own strength rather than asking the Lord to provide what seems good to him. But the thrust of this section is that they're gonna have a lot of good stuff and it's gonna be overflowing goodness. And God is saying, you didn't do it, you didn't do it, you didn't do it. Tell the people, I did, I am your provider. <clears throat> so you didn't plan anything, you didn't fill anything. And then in verse 12, it says, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. There he goes again. He's going back to his deliverance of his people and he says, it's the Lord you shall fear and him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear. We should fear God too. But too often we lighten our esteem of God and we don't reverence him as we should. The Israelites are gonna be so tempted towards the gods of the surrounding nations. Why? Because their gods are going to be enticing. They are. Their worship places, their carved images, their practice are gonna seem, practices are gonna seem interesting and possibly even a bit cool. And we're no different. That hobby becomes an obsession. That simple interest in what someone else has becomes covetousness. That visit to a friend's uh, church that you know is not preaching the um, true gospel and the true word of God begins to draw you in, maybe by the fellowship, maybe by the food, maybe by a relationship. We're tempted to go after the gods of other nations and we're tempted to go after anything else but God. And we seek approval too. We seek approval from our sisters in our parenting, in our style, in our choice of men, in our career decisions. We do anything for a promotion or a ministry position, but we'll do comparatively little to spend more time with God in word and prayer. Pretty soon, we don't even realize that we're worshiping the created things rather than the creator. Verse 15 reads, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. God is a jealous God. He will not share his glory with another or his praise. These are sobering words for rebel hearts. Will they listen and live? Verses 13 and 16 are both uh, quoted by Jesus in Matthew 4, verses 7 and 10, in response to Satan's temptations in the wilderness. Satan takes Jesus to the top of the temple and says, hey, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. The word says God will command his angels, right? He'll save you, he'll bear you up. And Jesus re responds with our verse here, verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then Satan takes Jesus to the top of a mountain and shows him all the kingdom of the earth, the word says. And he says he'll give it all to Jesus if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. And in response, Jesus quotes right here from our passage, verse 13. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you, ser shall you serve. Of course, Jesus couldn't be swayed by empty promises of power and protection, so Satan's plans were thwarted. But what about Israel? How did they test God? We're told they tested him at Massa. So if you flip back to Exodus uh, 17, it gives us the account in Massa. 
And, and there, the Israelites were thirsty, kind of like me, and demanded that Moses provide water for them to drink. Now, you think, what's wrong with that? Well, who should, they, who should they have been asking for a drink? The one who could actually provide it. Rather than in humble prayer and dependence upon God, asking him for what they needed, they, add, they start grumbling and complaining uh, to Moses. So the Israelite tested the Lord by saying at the end of in, uh, verse 7 of Exodus 17, is the Lord among us or not? Does that seem like a strange question to you? Did he not feed them manna every day for 40 years? Did he not keep their shoes from wearing out all that time? You would think they would have heard enough of the history of their parents to know that God is with them. He parted an entire sea. He delivered them from Pharaoh in Egypt. Their existence, their mere existence is living proof that God is with them. You know, unbelief can skew how we view history and how we look at God's faithfulness in the past. Unbelief makes us think that what God did back then isn't enough to secure our trust in, in the here and now or in the future. We can identify with this, can't we? God has brought us through all kinds of situations. Why don't we believe that he's still the same God who is worthy of trusting today. Now, you may have a circumstance right now where you're considering if God is still with you. You may be in a broken marriage or have a difficult relationship with a colleague at work or have strife with a family member or maybe you're enduring some sort of suffering. God is with you. Please remember that God will never leave us nor forsake us. He's faithful and he will give you what you need. Maybe he brings encouragement from a friend at just the right time. Maybe he connects you with a wise counselor or a pastor who can walk with you um, through your difficulty. Maybe he changes the heart of the husband or the colleague. Maybe the Lord allows you to suffer grief in all kinds of trials so that the genuineness of your faith may prove and result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The sin of unbelief is the root that causes us to test God. You only test God if you don't believe something about him. He's not who he says he is, he's not powerful enough, he's not concerned, he's not faithful. Don't believe the lies, sisters. God can be trusted, and he really is with you and will be with you to the end. In verses 17 to 19, God has promised to go before his people to be with them. It's fo this section is focused more on, you can tell this focus more on morality. On, it talks about doing what is right and good in the Lord's sight. Well, how would they know what's right and good? God has already given them his commandments, and God has given every person an inherent understanding of what is right and wrong. That's part of his common grace to humanity. You don't need commandments for that. You just need to be a person with a conscience. This whole warning section full of you shall not concludes with this contrasting, verse, uh, this contrasting set of verses in 17 to 19 that begins, you shall. Rather than taking credit for what God has done, Rather than serving idols and testing the Lord, instead, keep the commandments and do what you know is right. God has put it in our hearts and souls, the ability to make decisions that are morally right and good. On this point, uh, Spurgeon has a quote uh, that I really like. Sounds like somebody wrote it today. It says, modern thought has flung off obedience to divine revelation. And even in matters relating to social morality, many men reject all idea of anything being commanded of God. They only judge by what appears to them to be either pleasurable or profitable. What is most needed just now is that we, 
ourselves and those about us become really conscious of the greatness and sovereignty of God and yield ourselves to him to do as he bids us, when he bids us, where he bids us, and in all things to seek to follow his commandments that he may preserve us alive as it is this day. So rather than being self-centered, or Spurgeon says doing what's pleasurable and profitable to us, we have to hold on to who God is, his greatness and his sovereignty, what he's like. God is so good and so great and so sovereign and so worthy that we wouldn't even think to do anything other than what he has commanded us to do. We don't live in that kind of world. So as believers in the Lord Jesus, we have to be first in modeling obedience. What does the world do? We live in a world where everyone does what's right in their own eyes rather than what's right in the sight of the Lord. Paul reminds us in Romans 1 that what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. But what happened? For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So these warnings are in a sense a call for God's people to plainly see what God has made plain to them. His eternal power, his divine nature have carried them thus far and he will continue to show his mercy and faithfulness to them because he's good and he's a gracious God who keeps his promises to his people to bring them safely home and to thrust out all their enemies. That quote uh, from Spurgeon, what it's pointing out and what we see in Romans 1 and even what we're learning in Deuteronomy is that we need to think big thoughts of God Because what we think of him will shape our decision making and how we live day to day. Our responsibility is to obey and submit to the Lord because we love him and we desire to do what pleases him. We don't do what is good and right so we can be seen a certain way. We do what's good and right so God can be seen as great and good and sovereign. So there are going to be things for God's people to do and not do in order to worship him rightly in the land they're about to enter. Now here Moses says in verse one, uh, this is a commandment. And then he starts talking about loving the Lord with all your heart and soul and strength. So we know the command is love and the centerpiece of the statutes and rules of God is not the particular rules. The centerpiece is loving God in such a way and to such an extent that we desire to keep his commands. The chapter is a call to love, that's all it is. Love God with everything in you. Love God by teaching his love to your family. Love him by how you live in community. Love him in every aspect of your life. And out of the love that you have for the Lord, obey him. Obey him completely. Obey him entirely. Obey him fully. Obey him joyfully. Obey him trustingly. Obey him faithfully. And then finally, testify of God explicitly. Because guess what? Soon, Children are going to be asking the question, why do we have to keep all these rules? What's the meaning of all these commands? This is the question that's being asked here in verse 20. And it's a question that we get asked too all the time from children. Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do it this way? And you're going to have to give an answer for that. Kids ask this right now, and every child knows that the answer, because I said so, is a cop-out. And every parent knows this too. Every parent who says says this doesn't have a valid answer for when their children ask them why, so we cop out, because I said so. And we have to be better at answering that question. So what do we say? What do we say to our children? Well, my example for this is we were in church recently, and my husband wasn't preaching that Sunday, but um, he was leading prayer during the service. And 
he could barely pray because he kept having to stop to cough because he had a cold and allergies and all this stuff. And so my son whispers to me, Mom, uh, why is Dad in church? You know, he was like, shouldn't, be, shouldn't Dad be home resting and instead of sitting in church? So I said, you have to ask your dad when he comes to sit down. <laughs> and sure enough, as soon as my husband comes back to his seat, I hear my son whisper to Dad, Dad, why are you in church? You're sick. You're not feeling well. And without missing a beat, my husband answers, because he's worth it. He didn't say, because we go to church on Sunday, that's what our family does. He didn't say, Christians all over the world gather on the Lord's day, and that's our duty. He didn't even quote scripture and say, we're commanded to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. What did he say? He said, in effect, because I love him. He's worth it. And my son goes, he's 11, so you'll get this. He goes, huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but was it, I mean, that answer, I thought, what, where did it come from? It came from love within my husband's heart that overflowed into how he expressed, um, yeah, how he explained uh, why he was in church to my son. Because he's worth it. He could have said a lot of other things, um, but shouldn't this be our response as parents and anyone else who wants to pass on what we know of God's love to the next generation? They need more than our authority um, and a set of rules. Why do we have to do that? Because I said so. <laughs> you're just saying you're the authority figure and they need to just submit to, to you because you said so. But we're not the final authority, God is. So what is it that they need to be taught? Well, they need to be taught, it tells us right here um, in these verses, who they were. They were slaves. What did God do? He rescued them, he delivered them, he provided for them. And how does God want his people to respond to his mercy? He wants them to obey him and fear him. Reverent obedience, that obedience that comes from faith. And then God does something too. He responds to their obedience by counting righteousness to them. Not because they've earned righteousness through their obedience, because he's already delivered them. Moses concludes his charge to the Israelites to love God exclusively, to live for him fully by reminding them that the Lord's commands are for their good, for their preservation in the land, and for their righteous living before him. Chapter 7 details what the righteous living would look like, having nothing to do with the pagan nations or their gods, demonstrating that they are holy to the Lord, that they are his treasured possession, living courageously for God, trusting in God's ability to protect them. And the banner over all of this is what? Love. True love cannot be contained. You can't keep Jesus' love in a box. True love makes his commands a delight. We desire to keep them. We can't not keep it because we know what we were. We know what God did in our lives. And our hearts want us to respond in obedience and gratitude for what God has done for us. We're called to engage in a kind of godly gossip. Girl, let me tell you what God has done. Let me tell you what he's like. Let me tell you how good God is. Does love for the Lord compel you to get up in the morning, to start your day with his word, to commune with him in prayer, to go about your day so full of his love that it overflows naturally and steadily over the lives of your family and community? If you're like me, you at this point are bursting with love for the gospel. For it's in the gospel that God shows us our connection to our Israelite forebears. Who were we? We were slaves to our sin. When what did God do for us? He rescued us and provided his son to pay the penalty for our sins. And in response to his mercy and offering up his son uh, for our redemption, what does he call us to do? To the obedience to live in the obedience that comes from faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In response to our repentance from sin and trust in Christ, the Lord counts us as righteous before him and calls us to live righteously 
as an act of love both toward him and toward our neighbor. So testify of God explicitly. Are you able to tell this story to your children? Is this your testimony? Is this your testimony of God's rescue? Let us be women who are eager to tell and testify of the Lord Jesus and of his goodness by loving God exclusively, by obeying him completely, and by testifying of him explicitly. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word. We thank you for um, your servant, Moses, who spoke these words for our benefit, Lord. That we might be preserved, even to this day, Lord. That we might um, live prosperously in the land that you've given us, Lord, knowing that this is our temporary home. It's not where we belong. We know, Lord, that our home is waiting for us in, in, and it's an eternal home, Lord, where we will dwell with you and with one another forever. Lord, you have been good. You are good. You are great. You are sovereign. Help us to think big thoughts of you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to love you with our entire being. Help us, Father, to speak of you, um, speak of you boldly, speak of you clearly, speak of you explicitly. Lord, and help us to walk in a manner that would be worthy of the Lord. Father, we cannot do any of this in our own strength without the aid of your spirit, without the help of your grace and your love. And so we ask, Father, to do it in our hearts for your namesake. Amen.